Um, well, and now we're going to look to other parts of the world, to the new world. I'm going to talk to you about some not very colorful and well understood leaf poppers. Basically, all of these guys are just brown. Some, some of them are black. There's no beautiful colors, with some small exceptions as well. And I'm going to show you today this, what is this Mexican transition, transition zone, which is a major grade in Mexico, which has been involved in recent uh, knowledge uh, going to the biogeographic terms. But we're going to see the tools over, I think so, uh, already a uh, decade. And we're going to also see how this major grade shows some very interesting behaviors in the forest. So, should I work on oh. Well, um, where is the Mexican transition zone where we're going to see very quickly some physical attributes and uh, here have distribution, vegetation, this is the main key of this area because the, the vegetation is highly endemic. And also this endemism is very referent or it has to be associated with the altitude of these mountains. Um, there is an important component of uh, artesanines in this forest. Mostly this, this fauna has been collected in, in the canopies. And we have new tags uh, and of course the most recent thing that we're gonna do in these years and actually at the moment it's uh, a new DNA vultures. And of course, they improve because at the end of this talk, I'm going to show you how we're improving not only in this group of, of the hoppers, but we are also moving to other African families. But well, Mexico in, in numbers, uh, we have an approximation of 1,400 species. However, we know that this number is largely unknown in this country. And we always have this chance to speak up about the of Mexico. I use this example from iNaturalist. We can only see, for example, 275 species, which is a long number regarding what we all have in literature and also collections. And this shows how far we are to understand the total leaf over the diversity that we have in Mexico. And also, um, here there's like a a small attribute of this, this region, I'm going to show you a map after this slide. And the Mexican transition has a high number of endemic plants. This is the main key component of this huge mountain complex that we have in Mexico. And it shares unique habitats with also unique conditions. We have cloud forest, rainy forest, and we have other, area, other areas which have some transition between cloud to rainy forest. And among this, this, this area is also among the richest forests in the Americas and also shares biota from the Neartic and from the Neotropical realms. And this is exactly where it is. Um, between the Neartic and the Neotropics, we want to see this region. It is exactly where it stands. So, also, one of the main, it's not, it's not a problem, the main components that also we can find in this region is home of the most ancient native communities of Mexicans. They speak over 200 languages and they use all natural resources for traditions, for building, and the most important component for people in that area is for food resources. Insects are good, good issues. And this is the current classification of Mexico based on major, major, uh, major regions and superprovinces. This map is not very helpful, but we're going to use this one. So in the north, we have Neartic region. In the center, we want to see in this way color this Mexican transition zone, which usually shares vegetation, fauna, and even freshwater fishes in between Neartic and the Neartic region. And we can see easily how these regions are not divided just by a line. We have like a very specific, a complex polygon in these areas where we have this extremely, extremely habitat change, for example, in natural regions, especially if we focus on the center, we only see deserts. And then immediately to our driving, we have a town forest. Uh, this is, in general, how this guy looks. Uh, there's no beautiful colors. And like people say, this is one of the ugliest of covers. 
but for me they are the best. <laughs> but well, this is the total uh, number of general species that we have in Mexico. And there's 70 and 108 species. Uh, of these things that are new, uh, we have about 20 different species on the spiral still. And a couple of years, it, it will take to me to describe all of this genre. But well, going back to the main data, we have a huge data set, which I promised to you, Dimitri, in a few years, I will put into tax of works. But well, basically we have entire distribution for whole tribe in Mexico. This is a table, a figure, sorry, so we know the distribution per state in Mexico, which um, we can see here, for example, OG Apo, which means the rare state, is the, uh, we have the biggest biodiversity in this area, and it's just incredible. We have so many monotypic genera, and, and I've been trying to do my best always and every time being in that state just to collect as much as possible. And it's kind of predatory, but we, we need several, several genera from, from that state to improve our analysis, especially in the, in the microphylogeny. This is the results that we published just a few years ago uh, regarding the total of that we had in Mexico. At that time, we had only NG uh, is a uh, number of genera. It was 50, now we increased it down to 70, which is uh, a big amount of, of difference. But I'm going to skip this one because it's not, I mean, it's informative, but this, this one is more <coughs> illustrative. And we have this section, Mexican Transition Zone. In this area, and we have focused most of our work um, because it has to cover many Nearctic and tropical genera. And however, it, uh, it, it region also has shown to be one of the most prominent places to find new taxa, of course, uh, on the spread. There, there are provinces, and most of the, some of these provinces, they lay on these major regions. So we only focus on the, in, in the middle, which is an endemic species. And this area is known also as a trans-Mexican volcanic belt. This is the only complex mountain that is across Mexico, because the older mountains, they, they run parallel to the distribution of Mexico. But this one, it's like a physical bar. So this is exactly the place where all the tropical fauna uh, crash into the tropical fauna, and there are specific habitats. And this is places is exactly where, for example, the Guerrero State lays, and this is where we've been finding this very unusual and very extremely hard to find uh, the forest. Um, well, so we have presence of this tribe in 12 of the 14 provinces in Mexico. Uh, the Trans Mexican Volcanic Belt and the Balsas and Basin are the most richest. And I'm, I'm saying the most rich because I have over 60% of the tax. <coughs> this is the total genera and species that we have in the Nearctic zone. And it's, it's, this reflection of the biodiversity in this area has been highly explored by Northern colleagues and other people, most people from Texas A&M. And there's not too much biodiversity compared to the tropical or the natural region because most of this area is no like deserts or some dry habitats and even herophytic uh, habitats. And but compared versus the tropical region, we have region, and we have 121 species, which are all spread in, in this region, and it's still very unsampled. And in every time that they also trying to dig out with these places. And this is exactly what I want to show you. So we have only here 29 genera. Most of them are highly endemic. They don't move more or beyond the limits of this region, with some small exceptions, for example, uh, Nasania and all and another few Eutetics. And we have 180 species. Most of them also extremely endemic. We have uh, some oaks and also some pine. Another vegetation, we have a very limited distribution, and the species they only found in one, one host plant. And taking all these evidence, distribution plans, and also the abrupt topography that we have in this area, we, we have been um, dealing all this concept like a xenochrome. And xenochrome is this area where they have unique conditions and unique fauna. Of course, uh, this, uh, this red arrow is pointing. Uh, well, it should be more in the center, but we can see there's no point. We can see the TBV, which is a Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt, and this is this 
this this mountain will, will keep all all the mostly the, the majority of the Atacamas in Mexico. So in this Mexican volcanic deck, we, we have tropical rainforest, which has a richest biodiversity, pine oak forest, xerophytic ambience, cloud forest, rainforest, and talking forest. This is one of the pictures that we can find in these places. What about endemism? Well, in Mexico, near to 50% of the total of the 90 is potentially endemic. I'm saying potential endemic because I've just been in Costa Rica and I just found two species that we presently over time say is highly endemic to Mexico. No, I just find it in Costa Rica, which means we should explore more canopies in Central America. Those tags exceeding unusual morphology are mostly distributed over the Mexican transition zone. And here we, we have this species richness grill, which shows exactly where is it, the rich distribution, and we can see it is a little bit down to the center of Mexico with, with red color. Also, we found that it's very in substantially important the elevation for this genera, for this genera, mostly for the endemic ones, because they are highly um, limited by altitude. And there are some cases, for example, uh, the genus Crocasana is a genus described I just about, well in 1990s, and it's very sensitive, for example, for forest vegetation, forest adequations, and, and other similar similar conditions. The species originate is uh, also a parallel component to the humidity of these places. And at that, at that point, a few years ago, we also noticed that some of these species, they were recorded in 1930s to 1940s, but most of these species were gone, partially gone. So we, we set up this question, are there vulnerable copper species? And we found them. And we also found that the species are really displaced from the original habitat. And the main cases and threats are usual, at least happening around the world. Use of forestation, agricultural conversion and intensification, overgrazing. And the main problem of huge, huge tourist places is these large developments. However, we evaluate this species using the red list criteria and 180, sorry, 145 species were evaluated. This is the condition of the cessation risk of this species. We have 88 critical endangered. This is that. Well, I mean, we should continue in increasing these, these diametrics, especially in these evaluations, because this is just a potential hypothesis we should be exploring more. And one particular case is this species, Duopersona longula. We describe it in 2018, and this is the location, the location in La Reforma, one of the biggest states in Mexico, Oaxaca, and this is how it looks like for uh, 2022. So the, the, the type locality is just gone, and this is the only place where I've been collecting this species. I've been all across this state, but this is the only location where I can find it. This is one case, and this should be the same in other countries, probably in Philippines and around the world. And both Lefopra and Agita, they're critically <coughs> endangered. And we have other, other cases, quite interesting, because we only have the driving specimens in the museums. That's a material that we use for, for the oral analysis that I'm going to show you. Uh, but they're not been seen since until theories, but there is to the extent, who knows. And there's other reasons to collect, which, which is a, a good idea that there are some areas that they skill that uh, they are still, sorry, uh, keep uh, good, natural, good natural conditions for these reformers. Well, well, what do we have this from phylogenetics? And uh, phylogenomics, sorry. So the first thing is we include a natural of larger Mexican taxa by including Neartic, Neotropical, and the uh, Mexican transition zone specimens to promote a reliable framework to the tribal classification to the new world that is not. And of course, this was initially trying to solve issues within the Mexican anti but we, at the point we were ambitious and we include more, more tax, I and mean, we increased substantially the, the tax on something. So this is the, the, the general tree that we obtained, so sorry for the imagine it's too large this tree, but this is the first uh, phylogenetic representation of a 90 that includes most genome of the new world, and we also find and include the, the, this aversion type genus, which apparently to me, it's needs a very deep and uh, revision. And well, 
Another very interesting thing is that we found a sister plate of most atosanines, uh, including this monophyletic uh, lineaceous pen ring in biting and scaphitopini. But the, the sister, the, the immediate, immediate sister, is Opsi. We also run um, the same test for uh, morphology and genes, and we found there's a uh, strong similarity between them. However, the morphology is not really solving all the branches, and opposite occurs with the genes because the genes are really, really supporting our, our hypothesis. However, uh, we're gonna do a, a closer look at these three, especially on the genes. And what we have here is all tribes all grouped together and we're covered as monophyletic. This is only applies for the new world. This, it, it, for the case of new world, sorry, for the old world, it was totally different. So we have here, for example, these two uh, red arrows that are showing atosanimes from the old world. Uh, the branch report was uh, quite strong and most of them were 100%, there's only like three or four branches. And one more time, I'm sorry for the grammar error, atosanime is, is polyphyletic. So in this clay, this is the, the, the bottom of these three, is only showing new world atosanime. We have several groups of atosanimes, but if we focus on the last, is 84, I'm sorry, 54, it's unique mostly atasananis that occurs in Mexico and they are, for some high reason, only in the Mexican transitions. And we include in this analysis 93% of the total atasanani that we, we know in Mexico, described, not don't describe. And this is especially the, the clay that includes Mexico. Now we are currently working on big changes with the Atasinani plus other class lineages. Atasinani still is running out, well, we are running out analysis for understanding how topographic movements over, over time in Mexico were also, or, or will, or could show potential evidence of these lineages were spreading out while Mexico has not totally fit together and well. Moving aside, um, we are also working uh, in my lab with other Alcano Ranger groups. And currently, we are describing new genera, new species of leaf hoppers. We're running a, a, big, a big phylogeny of Graphocephala, this large pest um, uh, genus. And Mexico is one, apparently one of the main centers of distribution. And also, we're describing some species of leaf hopper based on amber. It's a very young amber, it's a Mexican amber, all known as. Uh, Amber from Chiapas. Uh, there's a couple of new fulgurids that we are describing from Mexico and also from Amber inclusions. We have some new calicerids from South Mexico and the new species of derbits. Uh, they're, they're related to, to poems, which is not surprising. And uh, one of these examples is we're naming these genes and species to, to Christopher, and the, the main epithet is dedicated to the god of the of the dead and king, Miklan. And I got a bunch of students, they are very active and we are working on making revisions of some of the foppers, for example there's some Dofa, and there's one in Brazil, Talanota. Um, we have been finding many specimens that they don't match any describes, that's why we want to do and, and be in obligation to do a review. And also there's one foot guy working with Fulgorids and a guy who wants to work with Empoasca. So this is a really, really Challenge for the center of Mexico, but he, we want to include one. Of, uh, I mean, we want to include also Costa Rica, but there's only two, three species. So that's that apparently. And finally, and most recently, we've got um, a very decent amount for ultra conserved elements. We want to do um, this for all the Canarincans, but the main idea is explore evolutionary histories and their accompanying factors. Uh, also, I, this is something I would like to discuss with Chris Lab. Uh, to compare all data versus the anchor hybrid enrichment that will be quite interesting, I think, at some point in the future. Superclassification and decompra classification for some genera. During my PhD studies, we realized that some apparently at this nine genera, they really don't belong to this nine. They belong to other tribes. And so genera with historical classification problems, specifically that they occur in Mexico, some genera are, for example, eutetics, chloratetics, among all the things with that example again. And 
that's it for me. So questions, preguntas, welcome.